it's working. Yeah, oh, you're good. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, I'm Buddy Pope. Um, welcome to the sixth lecture of the 75th season of the Amos Fortune Forum. Uh, please note the begging bowls at the exits. Um, donations appreciated to keep this wonderful organization going. Uh, there's a website, amosfortune.com, where you can find additional information about speakers and find links to re-listen to this recorded talk. Please leave us your comments and suggestions. There's small cards with pens that have been left on your seats. Please fill one of those out if you'd like to be added to the mailing list. These cards also invite your comments and suggestions for future topics and speakers. Interested in volunteering or becoming more involved in the Amos Fortune Forum? Please indicate interests on the card. Lastly, let us know what you heard about how you've heard about the forum. We want to be sure we're spending your donations wisely when we plan our publicity coverage. In 1946, when the founders of the forum were planning this series of talks, it was deemed that it would always be that there would always be an arrangement of flowers, fresh flowers on either side of the stage for each talk. In honor of our 75th anniversary, we would like to um, thank Cheryl Hackett for sponsoring the flowers for tonight's lecture, as well as Bonnie Cole for her artistry in creating these beautiful arrangements. We'd also like to thank Nancy and Dan Wilfred for the reception following tonight's presentation. Uh, we hope you'll join us to meet the speaker and enjoy some light refreshments afterwards. Um, this is going to end at nine o'clock and then Florence will be going directly over to the parish house um, for question and answers or um, just to, you know, uh, any other conversations you'd like to strike up at that point. Um, okay, so let me see here. I'm going to tell you a little bit about S, uh, SHI, also known as Sustainable Harvest International. Uh, SHI is a story come true, that of a nonprofit organization established in 1997 in Honduras by Peace Corps volunteer Florence Reed on a shoestring budget of 6,000 dropped in her lap by someone she had met in Europe who believed in her vision when all appeared to be lost. Operating currently in Panama, Belize, and Honduras, it's a story of resiliency, success, and of hope for our planet and its inhabitants. It is a story of grassroots success and ambassadors to a better future. It is a story about climate change and the race against time, the ace in the hand being a formula that is now proven, one that is right under our feet and that is, and can be, and must be replicated. It is a story of, on the one hand, multi-generational agricultural conglomerates, pesticides, chemical fertilizers, soil degeneration, slash and burn farming, and on the other hand, of cultural differences and bridges across those differences. It is a story of funding, donations, and ambassadorships it is a story of soil regeneration, tree planting, food security, carbon sequestration, wood conserving stoves, long-term commitment, risk, and risk education, field trainers, irrigation systems, investments in SHI, investments in villagers and SHI, by major corporations, coordination through partnerships, advisory council, reforestation, and of a vision already in motion. From the SHI website, www.sustainableharvest.org, 
our vision. By 2030, SHI will transform one million farms, plant one billion trees, sequester 18 million tons of CO2, regenerate one million acres of land, achieve food security for five million people. Our hope is that you can all become ambassadors to the vision through direct donations to SHI, introductions to corporate, educational, or personal friends that have interest in such small matters as saving the planet. I, for one, simply <clears throat> by seeing an opportunity before me to connect two parties and by making a simple introduction, was able to st start a discussion between Florence and the St. Paul School in Concord, New Hampshire. This resulted in ongoing student ecotourism visits to various Central American villages where they could see the successes of these villages and work the land themselves side by sides with the farmers and their families. One simple introduction is all that took. Think about that. I realize there are a lot of dots to connect here, so please give a kind welcome to my friend, our friend, Florence Reed, and sit back and listen as she puts it all together for us. Oh, I wish we had a hundred ambassadors like Buddy. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm sure glad you took that trip to Honduras <laughs> with us all those years ago. Thank you. Um, and thank you so much to the Amos Fortune Forum and to, to everybody here and giving me the opportunity to share a little more of this story. I'd like to start by asking all of you to think for a moment about what you picture when you think about where our food comes from. I think many people have an image of something very I idyllic, such as the farm in this picture. And probably for some of us, we are lucky enough <laughs> to get at least some, if not all, of our food from a place like this. Uh, most food, however, comes from something a, a little more like this that represents farmers borrowing money to buy agrochemicals and to buy machinery and to send their food across countries, often across the world, uh, and to often the people actually doing the work to make very little money uh, on producing the food. Uh, then there's the processing of the food and of course all of it contributing to global warming, to habitat loss, to, to many problems that we are facing today as humanity. And in my work with Sustainable Harvest, we're especially focused on farmers in the Global South, specifically, um, as Buddy mentioned, we work in Central America. And there we find that rural communities face this really difficult situation where they have practiced slash and burn farming for generations, and I think it was sustainable at one time when it was a small indigenous population and they could uh, complement the farming with hunting and gathering. They could leave a burned area in the forest to recuperate for 50 or 100 years. But now the population's much larger, the land's not distributed equitably, farmers have to go back after only a few years and burn again. The burned land is no longer surrounded by forest, it's surrounded by other burned land. And what little soil is there to begin with erodes away quite quickly. Maybe the productivity can be stretched out a little longer with chemical fertilizers, but chemical fertilizers also do a tremendous amount of damage to the soil over time. And so even that, while it may provide a boost for a little while, eventually both situations leave land very degraded, unable to grow crops anymore, unable to allow the forest to come back, um, at, at least in, in uh, our lifetimes. And this, of course, leaves the rural people in a very difficult situation when they can't grow their food 
anymore and when the land is, is so degraded. And they usually have a few options. They can pick up, move somewhere else, and um, maybe there's virgin forest and they can start slashing and burning there, start the process again there. And you see that happening even in national parks and protected areas. Or many move to the cities. Um, many try to come here to the US to try to find work here. And I'm sure everybody's familiar with all the stories associated with that. Um, whatever the situation, it's not a happy one for the, the farmers and their, their families being separated, working in difficult conditions, being affected by crime in the places that they go to. Uh, almost all of them would like to stay in their rural communities and grow the food to feed themselves and to have something to sell, uh, but they just need some more technical assistance to learn what we used to call more sustainable ways of farming. Now we more often use the term regenerative. So we're not just looking to sustain uh, this, this now degraded system, we're looking to regenerate the soil, regenerate the earth, regenerate the food system, um, and to do it with agroecology practices. So not based so much in chemical science, but based in ecological science, using the systems of nature that work <laughs> and can be applied to, to growing foods. And so this is the focus of sustainable harvests work. And uh, although our food system is currently a significant source of greenhouse gas emissions, in fact, if you take into account transportation and all the different pieces of it, it's almost half of greenhouse gas emissions are connected to conventional farming. It also has the potential to be a key part of the solution. Right, we, I think we all are aware of the crisis that we're facing at this point, but I think something people often don't think about is that even if we stopped all emissions tomorrow, and we do need to bring our emissions down, I believe, but even if we stopped them all tomorrow, the planet would keep warming because of the greenhouse gases that are already in the atmosphere. So part of the solution also needs to be to draw down some of those greenhouse gases, put them back in the soil where they've been lost from the soil, and put them back into plants um, such as trees. And these solutions could get us 40% of the way to the United Nations goals for net greenhouse gas reductions. And they could do it in a way where it's not making sacrifices, but it's actually benefiting people by allowing them to, to grow more food. And that's really what um, regenerative agriculture, or agroecology is all about. And it's based on a few basic tenets, and, and that's what our work is based on. Uh, the idea of not disturbing the soil more than necessary and allowing the ecosystem in the soil to thrive then maximizing crop diversity, so not having thousands of acres of corn or thousands of acres of soybean, but having uh, the biggest variety possible of different crops that support each other and support a healthy ecosystem that then maintains itself to a great extent with just a certain amount of stewardship from the farmer. Um, keeping the soil covered is another piece, whether that's with cover crops or with mulch so that you keep the moisture in the soil, you keep a steady temperature in the soil, and create a healthy ecosystem, again, for all the microorganisms that are some of the key workers when it comes to good farming practices. And connected to that is keeping living roots year-round in the soil that are taking advantage of all those nutrients at different layers in the soil, pumping them up into the vegetation, and then as the leaves and so on come back down, building the soil back up, and cr again, creating that healthy ecosystem in the soil. And then lastly, usually there's uh, some livestock or animals involved, as in most ecosystems, animals are, are part of it. And so these are the basic principles of regenerative agriculture uh, and agroecology. And this is the focus um, of our work with sustainable harvest. And 
we could work with the big, large-scale farms that are thousands of acres. Uh, and certainly, I hope to see more of those large farms making a transition in this direction. It is happening. But to my mind, the low-hanging fruit and the one that we choose to focus on are the smallholder farmers, the ones that are farming just a few acres that uh, are really struggling to, to get by. They don't have millions of dollars invested in the machinery and the infrastructure of conventional farming. They're farming by hand already. And by making a shift to these regenerative agroecology practices, they're able to produce more diverse crops, a greater abundance of crops, feed themselves better, have better income. And so it's um, almost a no-brainer when it comes to uh, a small-scale farm to decide to, to make this transition. And it's a, it's a much bigger lift for the large-scale farms. So we work with smallholder farmers. Uh, they also happen to be the farmers who are feeding about 70% of the world's population, despite having very little resources, uh, not having the majority of the farmland even. So with a little bit of additional support, they can, they can be doing so much more. And that's where we choose to uh, focus our work with farmers such as these who, when given the opportunity, embrace the opportunity to make that transition and shift away from burning, shift away from chemicals, and start establishing uh, a farm ecology that will benefit themselves and will benefit the planet at the same time. I think there is still a myth out there that these organic farming practices are not as productive as the conventional farming. What I've seen in the 25 years or so that, that I've been doing this work is the complete opposite, that the farmers actually are able to produce a lot more using these organic regenerative practices. Uh, studies of hundreds of farms around the globe have found at least an 80% increased productivity um, in the glo global south when people shift to organic farming. Uh, if you also take into account that sometimes organic products will get a higher price, the profit margin is, is even greater increase, up to 300%. So uh, organic is, is not a, a sacrifice in productivity. It's actually a, a benefit for the farmers when they shift to these organic practices. And the way that sustainable harvest carries out the work is uh, we hire local trainers, local experts in the countries where we work, Honduras, Panama, and Belize. So these are people who know the culture, they know the environment, they know the language. And they're the ones who carry out the work with the farmers. Uh, and these are some of our field trainers from our program in Panama. They've been with our program, some of them for almost 20 years now. And each of them works with a group of about 30 farmers. They visit those farmers every week or two for about four years. So it's sort of like a college education. And then at the end of the four years, the farmers graduate um, and there's a big celebration. And they're able to continue on and they're able to share what they've learned with others. But it does take this intensive multi-year approach for farmers in remote rural communities to move away from the way they've been farming for generations and, and take the tremendous knowledge they already have but build on it a number of new techniques, adding in a number of new crops, including tree crops, and learning how to make that all work together to grow a lot more, to feed themselves better, and to have more income for their families. And uh, I thought today I would introduce you to uh, one of the families in, in the program uh, as an example. So uh, this is Felicia and her husband Alberto, and they live in the community of La Pedregosa in the Cocle province in Panama. And they joined SHI's program because they had been trying to grow food for themselves on their land and 
were growing almost nothing. They had grown up doing slash and burn farming and finding that that produced very little uh, even when, when they were young. And now as the land had become more degraded, it was producing even less. So they were instead forced to go and look for work, um, earning maybe $5 a day, maybe now it's up to $10 a day, and then trying to make, stretch that out to, to feed their family when they wanted to be able to grow on the land that they had and grow better food and grow a better abundance of food for themselves on their land. So uh, they joined the Sustainable Harvest Program and our field trainer went and started meeting with people in the community and the program starts with just getting to know each other and uh, we explain what our program offers which is mostly technical assistance, very little in terms of materials and the community members explain what the challenges are they're facing, what their hopes are, what they would like to accomplish and eventually there's a self-selected group that signs on to work with the uh, field trainer for the coming four years and usually there's one member of the family who is our sort of lead farmer, our, our, our liaison to, to the family, but we try to work with the entire family and um, so in, in this case uh, with Felicia and Alberto, both of them were very involved as, as were their, their children and as we continue through the process each family makes a plan for what they want to accomplish during the four years working with us. They actually draw a picture of what their land looks like, and they draw a picture of what they want their land to eventually look like. And that serves as um, sort of the, the roadmap for the work that we'll do with them for the, the four years to come. And then the real work gets started uh, on, on the farms where our trainers do workshops, they hold classes, but they also are on the farms with their hands in the dirt, helping the farmers and their families to implement the new practices that they're learning. So here we are at Alberto and Felicia's so near the beginning uh, of their years in the Sustainable Harvest Program in, in 2016, where they were putting in erosion barriers. A lot of these small holder farmers are farming on hillsides. The, the flat land that's easier to farm is usually owned by the big farms. And so there, um, and there's Peace Corps volunteers in the room I know, so I'm, sound, I know this sounds familiar to some people. <laughs> and so they're uh, trying to farm on these hillsides where the soil all washes away. So we work with them on techniques such as putting in erosion barriers across the hillside to stop that soil from washing away. And they can be dead barriers with things like rocks and tree trunks and so on. They can be live barriers, plants like pineapples. Uh, they can be trees that if they start to shade the crop can be cut back and then they coppice and send out more sprouts. Uh, the leaves and the stems can be put down as a mulch to build up the soil. Branches can be taken for firewood uh, and the important piece, of course, of the barriers is stopping that soil from washing away. Uh, so that's one, one of the first steps in, in many cases. And then the, the soil that you're conserving, you want to make sure it's good soil, of course. So the farmers work with us to learn a variety of different ways of improving the soil with different types of compost. There's bokashi compost, there's your standard pile up all the kitchen scraps and let it decompose compost. We have composting latrines. Uh, we've partnered with other organizations to help build composting latrines with the families because many of them don't have uh, a sanitary um, latrine to use. And so it serves two purposes. It, it provides a health benefit of uh, having a sanitary latrine to use. And then the compost that's harvested from it can be used when planting trees or you know, crops where it won't be too close to the food, just <laughs> to be a little extra careful. Uh, it, it's composted well, so it should cook all the bad stuff out, but uh, we, we do try to be careful with that. And so these various practices all help build up the soil and create a healthy ecosystem in the soil and help all the microorganisms to do their job creating uh, the healthy crops. And then the families start to 
add more crops in. When they start with the program, they're usually growing three or four crops. Corn, maybe beans, maybe yucca, usually not much else. By the time they finish the program after four years, uh, they're growing 20, 30, 40 different crops. And they start them from seedlings. Uh, Alberto and Felicia made these nice little planters out of bamboo. Uh, they also learn how to make little planters from newspaper. So very simple, low cost technologies. And this is how they start their vegetable seedlings, their tree seedlings, uh, and start getting them out onto their land and the result is that they have this variety of new fruits and vegetables along with a greater abundance of the traditional staple crops so they, they don't lose those but they're able uh, to afford um, things like fruits and vegetables now to complement the the corn the rice the the beans that maybe they were growing before and they continue adding new practices for improving the soil. So uh, in, in this case, you can see some of those leaves and stems from the trees I was talking about, that they're nitrogen fixing trees, they're leguminous, so they're building up the soil and helping keep the moisture in. And those are some soybeans growing. This is the first time that Alberto and Felicia tried growing soybeans, and so this was going to be uh, a new food for them to add along with, with all of the others. And then as they see success, they want to do more of it. So the terraces that they had, they continue cultivating those. They start building more terraces. Uh, the terraces are the natural result of those erosion barriers. So the soil washes down, hits the barrier, and then it creates a natural terrace. And that's where they're able to uh, continue growing additional crops. And it, it's, as you can probably see, it's quite a bit of work at the beginning, but once it's established, the ecosystem takes care of itself to a great extent, and then it's a much easier proposition than, say, slash and burn farming. And, of course, it eliminates the costs uh, if they were using agrochemicals. Many of them said that they would spend more on the chemicals than they gained in, in what they produced. Now, instead of the chemicals, they're producing all their own natural soil fertility, and so they have that cost savings while producing uh, a lot more at the, at the same time. And they continue building on this, adding in more crops. Uh, there's the corn, which of course is a traditional crop, and there's celery, there's papaya, so they've got the papaya fruit. There's the, the grenadine, which they use to make natural fruit drinks. Um, I was mentioning to somebody earlier that unfortunately they want to give me something special and usually give me a Coke. Um, <laughs> I would much rather have the grenadine juice, but don't tell them. <laughs> um, and they continue on in this way. And, and the result, this is land. I wish I had a picture from the beginning when the land um, looked almost like a moonscape. And now it has this rich, dark soil that they've built up that's producing these beautiful crops that are so healthy that they're very resistant as well against pests. They're resistant against um, disease. If there is a problem like that, we also help the farmers learn to make natural pesticides out of plants that they have growing on their farms or that they learn to grow on their farms. And then once they graduate, they, they are able to continue with this and continue building on it. And it's multi-generational as well. And as we go along, we have some of these smaller side projects that aren't directly farming projects, but, but they're related in some way to the farming, to, to the trees. One of them is wood conserving stoves. Most of the families working with us uh, are cooking on, a, on three rocks with the fire and, and the pot sits on the rocks and so it uses a lot of firewood and uh, it also fills the room with smoke and so it, the, it's usually the women who are doing the cooking, they're breathing that smoke all the time and it's the small children, the children fall into the fire sometimes, it's very hot. Um, I forget how many million women die every year from complications from smoke inhalation from cooking over these open fires. So um, it's, a, it's a very serious problem, not to mention that it, it uses a lot of trees. <laughs> and so um, we help the families 
build simple wood conserving stoves that use ash as insulation so it keeps the heat in and it allows for a much more efficient system and they use about one third the firewood that they were previously using and they either have a chimney to take the smoke away from it goes over the heads of the people so they're not breathing that smoke or there's a secondary combustion process that actually burns off the smoke and makes it even more efficient and again addresses that that health issue and uh, the, the People who go to get the firewood, they say it saves them eight hours a week that they used to spend gathering firewood because it uses so much less. Uh, some of the women lately have been telling me they're really happy because it, it keeps the heat so well that in the morning there are still embers and they don't have to use a match every morning. So they're saving money by not having to use a match every morning. So there, I keep hearing about more benefits <laughs> from these stoves. And um, I think I have a little video hear of Alberto talking about the stove that he and Felicia built with us. Let's see. We built this stove with the Peace Corps volunteer and with Sustainable Harvest. They offered the project and we asked for it. We wanted to have it because the stove we have uses a lot of wood. So they brought us this project that was very accessible to us. And we feel very content with it because this helps us, our health mostly, because the smoke also affected us a lot. My wife, she suffers in her lungs, and cooking over an open fire was a problem. So with this, thanks be to God, we feel content, and it saves a lot of wood. And then the work continues with more ecological practices, with more crops, these are some of the Seedlings I talked about growing in the, the little containers made from newspapers. Then there's the fruits, the vegetables, and so on, all being planted out onto the farm. And this is looking down now uh, in the, they, they collected old tires and they use those as planters. So they've got some of their plants growing there as an, uh, another way of growing. You can see the pineapples on the left there, the vegetables, the fruit trees. And that hill in the background belongs to Felicia's father. And this picture was taken maybe a year or two before they graduated from the program and they were just moving towards the part where they were gonna start planting trees. They, um, Felicia's father agreed to let them plant all of it with trees, including coffee growing in the shade of hardwood trees, spice trees, nut trees. And so this is one of the practices we encourage a lot also to get trees back onto the land. Um, it doesn't work as, as well to have a big forest type environment for something like corn, um, but you can have things like breadfruit and mangoes and papayas. You can uh, have coffee or cacao for chocolate growing in the shade. You can have vines like vanilla growing up the trees. You can have things like ginger that do well on the ground in this forest type environment. So you can, again, produce an abundance and do it in a way that's providing habitat for wildlife. Um, the families talk about monkeys coming back, birds, butterflies, all these species that had been lost coming back because of the environment they're creating on their farms, particularly in the agroforestry systems where they're growing tree crops together with other crops. And that was the, uh, just about the last piece of work that Felicia and Alberto uh, did with the program. And then they graduated from the program. And in 2020, of course, COVID hit. And we were worried, of course, about the, the families. We weren't able to get out to visit them as much. But uh, we started hearing from them. Uh, some of them had cell phones. They knew somebody with a cell phone. Um, <clears throat> Alberto's son had a cell phone and took pictures of the food they were growing uh, when the country was in lockdown and sent a message to our office in Panama saying we're so glad that we learned how to do this because other families can't get the chemical fertilizers to grow their food and they can't grow any food. We can't get to the market so we can't get food there. Sometimes if we can get to the market 
there's not food in the market, but we're growing everything we need. We're feeding ourselves well. We're helping to feed our neighbors. We're getting through this because of the, these practices that we've learned. And so that's been an important piece. I, th I think Buddy mentioned resilience, and I think resilience is an important piece of this. And, and also the, the change in the farmers themselves who often come into the program um, having this very low self-worth where they've often been treated very badly, um, working on other people's big plantations, being paid very poorly, uh, and being you know, treated like almost subhuman, uh, being sprayed with chemicals, um, or maybe they're, they've been working in, in the city in horrible conditions and sweatshops, this sort of thing. And as they rejuvenate and restore their land and and talk about how they're restoring this planet for all of us, it, there's a real change in consciousness where I think, and some of them have said it outright, that uh, one woman said, I think the best thing about your program is I used to think I had no value and now I think I'm an important woman in this world. And so you see that happening and you see it um, with uh, Alberto who um, hardly ever left his community before going to national gatherings to talk about what he's doing on his farm. He and Felicia now um, are, are both known well, very much in their community, even beyond their community, and they're taking that leadership role. <clears throat> and I wanted to share a couple more of these short videos uh, so you can hear a little more of their words, uh, albeit with my <laughs> clunky translation, but here's, uh, here's Alberto again. The experience I've had here in 14 years, because I've been living here 18 years, in 14 years, or more like 15 years, I didn't accomplish what I have in two years, in two and a half years since Sustainable Harvest International has come here. With the experience Sustainable Harvest has given us, we have gotten ahead, because before it wasn't like this. If we grew crops, they produced almost nothing, because we didn't know. The ideas that SHI has given us have given us many results. In two and a half years, we think we've produced more than in most of the previous years. Before, I farmed just on the land. I wasn't thinking about col collecting what I cleared off the land to put it on the ground, but rather, to the contrary, I got rid of it. I burned it, or I bought an herbicide to spray because then the land was bare. I thought that was better but we didn't know the harm it was doing. But then, after Sustainable Harvest came and gave us experiences, and we've taken in what they've explained, now what we do is instead of burning, is collect the organic material and manage it to give fertilizer to the crops. Now we don't use any chemicals or anything, only pure organic fertilizer. So thanks be to God, we're doing everything possible and thanks be to God, with the ideas and the experiences that SHI has given us, we are trying to do better. We feel, how can I say it? Well, happy, because there's someone to teach us. Because if no one had come, we'd have continued with the chemicals, which were the worst things for us. And that's what I have to say. And thank you to Sustainable Harvest International. And the earning from my work on the farm gives me money to send my children to school, although they also help me work. And this helps me a lot. I do my work and grow certain crops to sell, and that allows me to pay for the school. I think that's one of the things we hear most from the families as well, that the importance of having that additional income so their children can go to high school or even on to college, and usually they're the first generation to finish high school, uh, let, let alone college. They have money for a better home. They have better health care. So all of these things come from shifting to farming that's uh, also providing tremendous benefit for the planet. Um, and I've got Felicia here also. Oh, well, I thought I had Felicia, but anyway, Felicia said similar things to what Alberto <laughs> said. And uh, here they are on the day that they graduated 
uh, from the program. <laughs> and uh, when the families graduate, they get a diploma, uh, which they're very proud of, that hangs on the wall. And there's a party afterwards. Their family members come from all over the country to see the graduation. Um, it's, it's a big deal. And you might have seen in the video some of Alberto's uh, and Felicia's farm had little signs that said tomate, and they have the signs because other farmers come to see what they've done and see what they're doing and, and learn from them. And so, so that's a piece of it as well. And they like to give back, uh, in, in this case, giving vegetables to our country director in Panama, but they also give back by sharing with their community uh, the food and, and the knowledge that, that they've gained. And they, they continue to grow more and more uh, as, as they continue with the practices that they've learned, their children pick it up. We now have adult children of graduates from the program who are doing the same and building on what their parents learned. And just to give a little sense of what, what this means with, with some numbers, uh, each of the families that graduates from our program restores an average of eight acres of previously degraded land. They each plant an average of 1,000 trees back onto that land. And between the soil and the trees, they're sequestering 160 tons of carbon over the course of 10 years as that goes back into the soil and, and into the trees that are growing. They provide food security for at least the five people in their family, if, if not more and the increased income and reduced expenditures allow them to uh, meet many of their other needs. And it currently costs about $1,000 per year or $4,000 for one family to go through the program, although we're trying some pilots where we think we can bring that cost down by about 50%. And that's, that's one farmer um, who's, I think, uh, doing a wonderful job. Uh, he's one now of over 3,000 families who have graduated from the Sustainable Harvest Program. Collectively, they've planted 4 million trees and they've restored 26,000 acres of previously degraded land. And they've seen their agricultural income increase by at least 23%, and in, in many cases much more, um, and that's not including the savings they have from growing their own food, uh, from producing their own fertilizers, and so on. And then, of course, at the same time, they're also providing this tremendous benefit uh, for the environment by helping address issues like biodiversity loss and, and climate change. And now what we're thinking about at Sustainable Harvest is the fact that we're proud of what we've done with 3,000 uh, family farms, but there are over 500 million smallholder farms like Alberto's and Felicia's around the world. And if all of them were to make this transition to regenerative agroecology practices, not only could they achieve food security, um, end hunger for their families and, and for others, improve their income, they could also provide a, a significant part of the solution to climate change at the same time. So now we're thinking about how can we reach a, a lot more of them. Um, and we've calculated that if, if all 500 million smallholder farmers made this transition, it, it could uh, get us about 53% of the way to the UN goals for net uh, greenhouse gas reductions, but of course, reaching 500 million farms would be a rather large task. Um, it, would, it would be rather costly. Um, I did calculate it out though, and I figured out that it would take um, approximately 5% of what the governments of the world currently spend on subsidizing conventional agriculture, which is doing tremendous damage to the planet um, and producing uh, a lot of food that is not terribly healthy for us to eat either. So I feel like we should be able <laughs> to redirect 5% of what's already being spent to make this transition uh, to stop hunger, to stop poverty, to stop global warming, to stop biodiversity loss. And we're looking at it uh, in, in just as a thought practice in terms of what, what might it look like for one country. And so uh, just as a thought practice, I, I, I looked at Colombia and figured that if they took about half of what they currently spend, 
on agriculture, forestries, fisheries um, for several years. They could reach all 3.8 million rural poor in their country, get them out of poverty, uh, end hunger for those families, and also reach 56% of their own greenhouse gas reduction goals. So the, the potential is there. Um, we're now working at Sustainable Harvest on trying to do our part to lead the way. And so we've set a big audacious goal uh, to reach a million farms by 2030, uh, which would restore 8 million acres of land and uh, achieve food security for 5 million people. We're doing this in line with the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And we don't think we can do it ourselves. So we're working to do it through partnerships and through some of these uh, cost reduction uh, efficiency pilots that we're testing right now to, to make the whole program more scalable. And so that's our million farm transformation and to invite you all to read more about it on, on the website. And um, I hope I'm not going over. I'd like to end with one last video and then hope there will still be a little time for uh, some questions. Lograr algo en la vida es algo, algo que uno lo llena de orgullo, fíjense, cuando usted se pone una meta y, y cuando usted siembra una plantita, usted la siembra con cariño y, y sabe de que esa plantita le va a producir alimento. Cuando inicié yo era un campesino jornalero, eh, yo me dedicaba a ganar mis 120 lempiras diarias, 100 lempiras en aquel tiempo, bueno, hace cuatro años. Si queríamos comer una fruta, teníamos que comprarla. Sustainable Harvest International's five-phase program empowers families, individuals, and communities to preserve our planet's tropical forests while overcoming poverty. Through SHI's programs, farming families are trained in how to produce food sustainably and organically rather than relying on traditional but harmful slash-and-burn methods. Tropical forests provide us with oxygen, stabilize the climate, and are home to over half of the species of life on the planet, yet they are being destroyed at alarming rates. A veces se aplica mucho químico en la tierra, meten fuego a los rastrojos para sembrar maíz, frijoles, y todo eso nos daña todo. Antes de que Fucoso llegara a la comunidad y que yo fuera parte de esa familia, yo hacía igual que la, sin ninguna conciencia, sin ninguna mentalidad. Pero ya cuando vino Fucoso, eh, ya, ya la institución nos enseñó a, a trabajar de diferente forma. Ya todo a base de abono orgánico. Mi nombre es Doris Esmeralda Sandoval. Vivo en la comunidad de Piedra Gorda. The families of Piedra Gorda are in the beginning phases of SHI's program and are just learning to work their land with organic practices. Their local field trainer will teach them how to make compost, diversify their crops, and save seeds from one year to the next. They will then go on to teach the farmers how to identify markets and strengthen their entrepreneurial skills. After approximately five years, the farmers will graduate with the ability to support their families and become community leaders. Antes va, el costumbre era de, de quemar la tierra, pues, que cosechaba muy poco, va. Entonces allá a mitad de año teníamos que comprarlo, va. Tratamos, hacemos el mayor esfuerzo de transmitir a las familias conocimientos sobre los principales nutrientes que contienen algunos alimentos, para que ellos mejoren su alimentación. Queremos cambiar ya, queremos cosechar más. Si yo no cuido el entorno donde vivimos, ¿dónde van a vivir mis hijos? ¿Dónde? ¿Qué, ¿Cuál irá a ser el destino de ellos? So what will be the future for our children? I think it can be a very poor and 
degenerated one or it can be an abundant regenerated one. And I invite all of you to learn more and uh, to ask any questions that you might have. I think we've got about 10 minutes for questions here if there are any or comments or thoughts and uh, then I'll, I'll talk with people at the reception afterwards as well. We haven't really met with much resistance. Uh, we haven't met with much support <laughs> uh, either from uh, governments, whether governments there or our own government. Um, and, and, and we've certainly come up against some new situations where there's other influences in encouraging the farmers to, to go a, a different, different route, but um, they always say la prueba está en la masa the proof is in the pudding, and what we teach works for them, and <laughs> so they, they, they stick with us. Um, in fact, uh, we, we went back and did a survey of families five, 10, 15 years after they had graduated from the program to see whether they had continued, and we found that 91% had continued with the practices they had learned in the program, which is, um, I think quite unusual for international development work and particularly in agriculture. And I think it's because we put in that time for, for this multi-year individualized um, type of approach. Yes? Is that Brad back there? <laughs> I think this is definitely applicable to other parts of the world. Of course, wherever you go, there will be different environment, different geography, different climate, different culture, different language, all of that. Uh, but the basic core tenets um, of the program, I think, could be applicable certainly anywhere in the global south and maybe even other places. Uh, as well, and they would just need to be adapted. And, and we are thinking about that. Um, as we scale up, we want to see how much we can do in the countries where we're already working and in Latin America, Caribbean, where we have a better uh, understanding of, of the, the culture and, and the environment and the language and so on. Uh, but we also want to remain open if, if the opportunity is there to do more with the right partners in, say, Africa or Asia, we, we want to be open to that as well. Uh, so we have some criteria for how we look at where we might work next, and we're remaining open to opportunities. Um, I'm joining a delegation to Cuba in, in October, I think, because there may be an opportunity um, there. Uh, and we, we want to find places where we can have a nationwide impact and start to have those examples uh, for, for other countries to follow as well. And we're early in this implementation of the scaling up plan, uh, but, but that's the direction that we're headed. And, and as a follow-up, here in the States, we hear a lot about the forest and mm -hmm. degradation of the forest. Yep. Um, is, is it so bad, do you think? And is this something that we can count on what's going on with the forest? Right, first up, I should finish answering your previous question. Is, which is there are other organizations doing similar work now. Um, for a long time, as far as I know, we were the only ones. Um, but thankfully, um, in the last maybe 10 years, other organizations um, in Latin America and other parts of the world have, I, I don't think they take quite the approach we do, but there, there's a lot more growing interest in working with farmers on shifting to these regenerative and agroecology practices. Um, I know there's interest in Brazil and there's some work happening in Brazil um, in, in agroecology and 
uh, permaculture is sort of a variation on, on this, and, and they're doing that work. I've, I haven't been to Brazil myself, but my understanding is that the, the, the deforestation is as bad as you think. Um, and, and so I think that there's a tremendous need for this type of work, and, and certainly if we had the opportunity to d do work there, I, I think we would welcome that, even though we'd have to find people who speak Portuguese. <laughs> We all speak Spanish. <laughs> um, yes. Two questions first. How can I support your program? Second, <laughs> That's a question I love. <laughs> are you looking at applying this to the United States, certainly students of the US? Yeah. Um, that's a question that we've gone back and forth about for uh, our 25 years of existence about the, the United States because certainly we have environmental degradation and we have poverty in this country. Um, I, I think you know, it, it would be an experiment to see whether it, it could be applied because so things are so different here than um, say in Latin America, but I, th I think there is the opportunity for it. I certainly um, have friends who uh, aren't able to feed their families well and I think, and they, they've tried to grow some food themselves, but it's, it's been too much. Um, and I think somebody holding their hand through it as they're getting started could be a tremendous benefit. Um, so personally, I would like us to see, see us try something um, here in, in the US. Um, but quite rightly, uh, uh, some, some of our board and some of our staff feel like we need to stay focused. Uh, one of my board members, who actually used to live near here, uh, would always say, Florence, stick to your knitting. Um, so um, I have a broad definition of my knitting. But, um, and as, as far as uh, supporting us, um, helping us uh, spread the word is a great way to do that. Um, you're buying food from farmers that are uh, using practices like this is, is a great way to support this overall effort. Um, and I hate to say it, but what we need most is uh, financial support. Um, and uh, if anybody wants to talk to me uh, afterwards, I'd you know, be happy to pro provide my card with, or an um, envelope with some more information. Um, and we certainly would welcome that. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, we we were certainly inspired by him. Um, he and um, and uh, others uh, like Rodale uh, uh, and, and others are early who are very early adopters of the permaculture and organic and, and so on, uh, I think uh, allowed us to do what we do now. Um, and other organizations, I think like Heifer, that really sort of spearheaded this, the idea of giving somebody, uh, teaching somebody to fish instead of giving them a fish and, um, and just paying it forward. So uh, yeah, it's so many people and organizations um, laid the groundwork for us to do the work we do now, and, and uh, we have some wonderful organizations that we collaborate with to, uh, to be able to do a lot of what we do today. It's, um, we're, we're all in this together. <laughs> Um, what's the name of the program at MIT, do you know? Is it D? D-Lab, yes, I've heard of D-Lab, and, um, and what I heard about it made me think that there, there could be synergies and that it could benefit us to work with them, and um, I'm afraid we haven't made it happen yet, but um, I, I would love to see us 
uh, collaborate with D-Lab. Uh, we have collaborated with Engineers Without Borders in the past, and that's uh, been very valuable and I think beneficial for both of our organizations, and, and I would think we could have something similar with MIT's D-Lab. So thank you for the reminder. <laughs> Am I getting the hook? All right, uh, we hope you've enjoyed tonight's uh, lecture. We invite you to join us next week for the final lecture of the 75th season. Steve Zakon Anderson will be discussing the community building history of contra dancing in the Monadnock region. The Amos Fortune Forum is now adjourned. I'm gonna ring this bell. I would say also, if you've got interest, um, do go to the website, sustainableharvest.org, and uh, you'll find out lots more. Thanks. Thanks.